Welcome to Finding Certainty with your host and U.S. Army veteran, Patrick Lang. Over the next hour, you'll learn from Patrick and his expert guests how to attract more certainty into your business and your life. Now, here is your host, Patrick Lang. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Finding Certainty. And Happy New Year, almost. We're here on December 30th, so another day or two, we're going to be launching a whole new 2023. So I have a very special uh, guest today, a good friend of mine, Cindy Berkland, who's the founder and CEO of Eternity Financial. Uh, she also runs a, uh, a really a, an extraordinary networking group here in uh, the Las Vegas, Nevada area, Henderson, Nevada, uh, called Speakeasy. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that too, because the story behind it is is one you're you're not going to want to miss. So, Cindy, thanks for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thank you for having me on the show. This is fun. Our pleasure. So, Cindy and I are more recent uh, acquaintances. I relocated uh, our company here to uh, Henderson, Nevada, earlier this year. And I uh, have a very good friend, Frank Hellring, who many of you may know. He runs the uh, the headliner show here on Voice America Business Buzz. Well, he introduced me to Cindy and to another good friend of ours, Simone uh, Kvalheim, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago. So, um, so we haven't known each other very long, but I've been so impressed with with everything that Cindy is doing and has done and is accomplishing with her business, the way she's really blessing people's lives. I just had to have her on the show and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what she's doing, how she's doing it. So so um, again, thanks for being here, Cindy. And and you live in Henderson. I think you're my first local. Well, I guess uh, Simone is from Vegas, but you're my first actual Henderson local, my first neighbor, if you will, that's been on the Finding Certainty show. So you have that distinction. Yeah, I, have, I have been in Henderson 27 years. So wow. I- I'm almost a local. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit longer than me. I've been here about yeah. 27 minutes. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we just moved here from San Diego in March, as you may recall, but, um, and primarily because as much as we love San Diego, I mean, and the weather is sublime, um, California is kind of coming off the rails, you know, the rising costs and the taxes and the politics, the government, just so many things that are out of our control and are not positives. You know, that's why people are leaving California in mass, even major corporations like Tesla and others have up and left. And so, I mean, if you're going to let Tesla leave your state, you're you're obviously not thinking straight or not doing something yeah. right. There's so. been a lot of great businesses leave California and a lot of great people. Um, I think the best of the best people are leaving California. I know Nevada, you're one of those people. We've gained over a quarter of a million people to Las Vegas from California alone this year. It's it's pretty mind blowing um, what has happened. Um, they right. keep running their, their business in that state like they are. They're going to see more of the same. Um, and the people that are the ones they're taxing to death. That's the tax base they're losing. So, but mm-hmm. more power to them. Let them do what they're going to do. They're just going right. to drive their state into bankruptcy, you know? Well, it's unfortunate because it's a beautiful state. There's a lot of good people there. We enjoyed it. We were there for three years, um, but we, I think we probably would have stayed longer if things were differently just because the weather is so amazing. And it's, we were 10 minutes from the beach and, and so forth. But you know, I think people are leaving um, California in many respects because they don't feel secure there. They don't know how to predict the future. They don't know how to predict taxes and other things. They don't have certainty, which is our, you know, our word. But, uh, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show because of what you do to create certainty in our, you know, in your clients' lives. And so I always start the show out with, by sharing two main reasons why I've invited uh, this specific guest on, on finding certainty. And the first is that uh, Cindy is a phenomenal example of someone who has learned from her past, learned from hardship and trials that she went through and that were imposed on her. I mean, the crash of 2008, we're going to hear your story a little bit, but you know, you learned from it and you've applied those lessons and not just 
applied them in your own life, but now you're blessing others' lives in the process. And it's such a great story. It's such a great example of how all of us, I think, should approach our own trials of life. I mean, they're going to happen, right? It's it's mortality. But but the second thing is, uh, Cindy, speaking of sharing what she's learned with others, she's so outgoing and altruistic that she has created this really phenomenal networking group here in the, the local area that in many respects has emboldened and empowered small business here in Henderson. And I think even saved businesses that maybe would have gone out of business during COVID. And so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to talking about that with you a little bit later too. So, so maybe just tell us a little bit about your, your background. Where'd you grow up a little bit about family and how'd you end up in Henderson, Nevada? Um, I was actually raised in Montana. Uh, The Yellowstone river was my backyard. I had a very, um, conservative upbringing. My father was a pastor. My mom was a homemaker. Um, and we left the state of Montana when I was 15. My dad wanted to go into, he wanted to get his master's degree in counseling. And so we left and moved out to Portland, Oregon. And he went to um, Western Evangelical Seminary and got his master's degree. During that time, I was in high school and then went on to college, got married. And I started in, I was uh, in the title and escrow business for years in Portland. And then I went in, um, I was recruited into mortgage. I was in finance and mortgage and um, fell in love with the mortgage industry. Um, I got my start in um, second chance financing and uh, high risk mortgages. So I learned, I kind of cut my teeth on the hard, hard kind of loans. And uh, then um, I was promoted into management and given a branch in Las Vegas, Nevada. So that's how I ended up here at age 26. I was given a branch um, at a subprime mortgage company. And I got out here and I had about 40 employees all over the age of 40. And here I was 26 years old, you know, taking over this (laughs) branch, this young hotshot loan (laughs) officer given a branch and I didn't really go over too well. So I, I pretty much had to start over with the branch. I had to come in and clean house. And man, I learned a lot at, at such a young age. But yeah, I got here 27 years ago um, with a three-year-old in tow. And um, so I, uh, you know, the mortgage market was very, very different in Las Vegas as it was in Portland, Oregon. Um Portland was more of a fast growing high equity at the time and Las Vegas at the time was not, we were growing about one to 3% in equity per year. So it was very, very difficult to do refinance loans. So I uh, very quickly decided I needed to go out on my own. So I started my own uh, mortgage company um, and we became very, very, very successful because about that time, the market was just on its way up and, we were doing incredible things. We became the number two company in the state of Nevada in under a year. Wow. Um, so we got to the point I had about 85 loan officers and 15 on staff to support them. And we were growing and making lots and lots of money. Um, and at that time, I also started, you know, buying houses and flipping houses. And, you know, I was very, very young, making all kinds of money and, you know, living the uh, dream, living the dream and living that lifestyle. And, And, you know, I had survived a lot of recessions during that process. So, you know, as I came up in the business, there was three recessions that um, I was involved in that, you know, I I learned how to get through those. Um, When 08 happened, however, um, I was not prepared for what happened there. And um, it was such a huge crash. It was... uh, uh, it's let a disaster. Me, let me pause you there for a minute because I want to go back to a couple of things you talked about and then let's get into the crash because I went through it as well. I can definitely resonate with the experience, but we, uh, you talk about the yellow or the Yellowstone River. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a big fly fisherman. So you grew up in my, uh, you yeah. know, my, uh, my dream, you know, the river runs through it and the whole, the whole thing. And uh, I'd rather be on a f- river fly fishing than probably just about anywhere else. But, and then I don't think I had realized that you lived in Portland. I lived in Portland for 12 years. So um, yeah, I was in Portland for, I think it was 10 or 12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We were in Lake Oswego and Sherwood, Tigard, that mostly Southwest, that area. All my kids live in Oregon still. 
my son works for Intel and uh, my daughter is, she went to Wellesley College in Boston on a full ride scholarship. She's the brainiac, but she, uh, she's applying for dental schools there. My daughter's a, uh, she's a gymnast for the Ducks in, at, at Eugene and uh, I've got a son in high school. I've got one son actually is in California at Cal State, but um, so yeah, so we have deep roots in the Northwest. It's gorgeous. Yes, gorgeous yes. country in fact if i can interject i i was nervous about moving to the desert because i miss the green i love the rivers and the trees and the waterfalls and i didn't know if i would like las vegas but have come to find out that it's it's a really great place to live there's just yes. wonderful people here there's so much to do it's a great you know it's a great airport um so he's well, what i traded always something was for happening, the dryness right? in the desert and, and it's not as pretty here in some respects right. um but i will trade sunshine for rain any day and you know when right. we first moved here every day my three-year-old would run to the window and go it's not raining today and, I tell her, <laughs> and this went on for almost a year every day she'd go to the window because she used to play in the rain in her slicker at you know, in Portland, right, and, right. Uh, when she was, when we got here, she was just so uh, blown away that every day it sunned here. She'd call it, it's sunning again today. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to awesome. sun every day, honey. It doesn't rain here like that. So it you know, it was a great uh, transition for sure, but she, it took her a minute to get used to it because she was so used to playing in the rain every day, you know. Poor yeah, little thing. <laughs> I, I, I can relate to that. I mean, you got to have rain to have green, but it's that's the number one reason we moved to San Diego. My wife just needed to get out of the rain. She needed the sunshine and we need she needed to go do some work with a physician down there. She has some health challenges, but but yeah. So anyway, just a an aside. We have Northwest roots and you grew up where I wish I'd grown up. I mean, I grew up in Utah, so there's great fishing here too, but we all dream of fly fishing in Montana, right? If you're a fisherman. So, okay. So moving on though, 2007, 2008, it was more than just a recession. I mean, it was yes. a absolute yeah. crash. Uh, at the time I owned a consulting firm. We helped startups find capital help them with their business plans and so forth and so on. And, and our business literally went out of business overnight, mm -hmm. right? It sure would have. Yeah. I mean, they the money didn't go started. anywhere. Yeah. It, just, it didn't go anywhere. There's so money out there just went underground. Everybody pulled back and I mean, it was, I lost everything and I know you did as well. So yeah. go ahead, let's, let's get into your story there because I know it was quite the trial. I think um, you lost a lot more than I did, but I definitely felt the pain. Well, you know, I had, you know, been spending accordingly to my income and um, had a very large home in Anthem Country Club with a very large mortgage payment, you know, car payments to boot, but we were doing fine. So it was like, you know, I was moving up my, my income to match my money or, you know, my, yeah. my spending. Um, the problem with that is when the bottom fell out, um, I remember one day, I mean, so we were doing mortgages you know, just like normal, but there was what we called a mortgage implode site. So we were, we had a site that was literally telling us every day what mortgage companies were going out of business. And I remember when that site showed that IndyMac was going out of business and IndyMac was one of the largest banks and we did all of our loans through IndyMac. I mean, I, my blood was running cold. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around what was going on. And, um, Within 12 months, I had, I lost 88 banks and the final two were Wells, uh, no, it was Bank of America and Countrywide and they merged. So I was left with one bank out of 88 banks that we worked with. And uh, so I literally lost 95% of the business that I could do overnight. And um, I was horrified as to what was going on. And, and then even we were doing loans and then the banks would unfund the loan. So we'd get to record, you know, docs, we'd fund, and then they'd unfund them. And, and I'm like, how can you unfund a loan? We just closed. So uh, in, in one day I lost, I think $98,000 in commission in the middle. And I just, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to survive. And I, I drove home 
And my mom, I was sitting at home in the middle of the day, just, I poured myself a huge glass of wine. And I'm just sitting on the couch. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, and my mom came in the door with the kids and she about fell on the floor because I was home. And she goes, you know, she was talking to me. I said, mom, it's over. And she said, no, honey, you're always, you know, you always land on your feet. You'll get through this. And I said, mom, it's different this time. This is, she said, no, 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 you're going to be fine. And it was some, I could not pull through it. It was, it was over as I knew it. And, um, everything I had, everything I had was lost except for my one home. So I, at that time had a commercial building and 12 homes and, um, it was, it was a wrap. <laughs> so I'm all um, go away. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, you know, when I moved to Oregon, I moved to Portland in August of 2007 and excuse me, it was already starting and we were, we were, um, I was raising funds. I'd, I'd spent the two years prior to that working for a real estate developer in Utah. And we had millions of dollars of projects all over the country, mostly kind of high-end areas like Vail, Colorado and Aspen and La Quinta, California, near Palm Springs and Tamarack, Idaho, you know, just, we built these high-end condo developments in these resort locations. And he was the same way. He was overextended because he hadn't paid cash for these properties. He put down earnest money. He had construction loans, had projects at different phases of development. And suddenly the bank stopped lending in the middle of their projects, you know, yeah. like you in the middle of even when it had been funded. And so I had just landed a big, a big commission. I mean, a half a million dollar commission. It's the biggest thing I'd ever seen when I raised money for a large uh, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae banker in Texas. And we thought, well, we're, we are going to be, this is it. You know, that's when I started my firm. <laughs> I, we decided uh. to move back from Salt Lake city to Oregon um, where my wife is from. And, um, we put a 20% down on a house, a big oh, you know, mil no. million dollar home up on the hill in Sherwood, Oregon. Oh no. We were pre-approved. We were just going to sign documents and the bank said, sorry, that loan isn't, that lender isn't doing jumbo loans anymore. We're like, well, what do you mean? Okay, well, let's find someone else, I guess, who will. And I spent about six weeks, almost every day at that mortgage or in her office, writing letters and trying to find a lender who would do this loan. My kids, my wife, five children, and a golden retriever were stuck in the residence inn in Lake Oswego, Oregon, <laughs> climbing the walls, trying to close on this house. And finally, we had to end up just leasing a home because we could not get, I mean, we were doing stated income because we were self-employed and yep. had recently started our business. That all went away, you know, so, so it was a nightmare and my uh, real estate developer that I worked with ended up losing most of his projects. And just, yeah. it was, it just, it was, that was, I was living that was life terrible. for months. It was, I, I just, it was horrible. You were smack dab in the middle. I was on one end of it. I was a client, but you were yeah. on the other end trying to yeah. fund loans, right? That was your whole business. So, yeah. so how did you, as you were going through that, what were the thoughts and the feelings you talk about sitting there with your huge glass of wine, telling your mother it's, I think it's over, but Think about how you felt in, in 30 seconds, if you would just kind of encapsulate it. Then we're going to go to our first break and then we're going to come back and talk about what happened next. So, well, I was, when I realized I describe it like, um, you know, the Titanic hitting the iceberg, um, they didn't sink immediately, but they knew the second they hit the iceberg that they were going to sink. It was, they, that was something you just didn't want to hit in the middle of an ocean. So right. I knew I had hit the proverbial iceberg and that I was going to sink. I just, you know, and, and, and that's exactly what happened. It took about a year for me to completely sink. Um, so I knew I was going to have to make moves to survive it. And I, I had a moment with me and the Lord one day, I'm like, okay, I surrender this whole entire thing to you. There's nothing I can do. I will do what I can do, but God, you're going to have to do the rest. And I just gave everything up to God because I'm like, I, I'm done. There's there. I'm one, a very resourceful young woman, but that was for me. I'm like, there's nothing else that can be done. 
it's got to be God from here. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, I, I so resonate with what you're saying. I can remember having those same conversations and having that same, those same thoughts and just saying, what do we do next? And how do we get through this? So it's time for us to go to break, but we're visiting with Cindy Brooklyn of Eternity Financial. Um, come right back, folks. We'll be right back with you. We're going to continue the story and talk about what Cindy learned from it, what we both did, and what came of it, which is the rest of the story, as Walter Cronkite used to say. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All clear. Great segment. I think it was Walter Cronkite, right? And that's it the was. rest of the story, right? Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey. I have to correct myself <laughs> when I come back on, on air. I, I remember think... listening to him because my dad would listen to him all the time. Stay tuned for the rest of the story. Yeah. So with, with the YouTube video, they run two or a couple minutes of videos, but I always say, watch the YouTube and you'll get the behind the scenes stuff and you know, the, the chit chat in between. So we're still recording. So, oh, okay. So you, uh, um, I th think it's interesting. We have a lot in common, Cindy, both in Portland and both. I worked in mortgages actually prior to working for the real estate developer and, and, um, you know, and man, I learned a lot from that crash of 2008. They were painful lessons, but yeah. Well, I think, you know, I learned, told learned a lot. I I tell a lot of people that I feel like God loves me so much because he allowed me to go through almost, you know, it wasn't on the level that Job did, but I went through such horror that I had no other choice, but to reinvent myself like over and over and over again. And for some people that just allowed themselves to curl up into a ball and not grow, I'm like, if you can't grow from adversity, there's something wrong with you. And I, I look at how I can bounce really high now because of that. Yeah. So, um, well, you have you know. to learn to, to pivot. And I, mm -hmm. I talked about, I want to talk about it later, that later in the show. Sure. Just so you know, you've got, uh -huh. you've got a hair sticking straight up on top. Coming back now. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> You are listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang. Have a question for Patrick or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. Thanks for coming back, everybody. I always appreciate it when you don't leave and uh, go listen to someone else. <laughs> We are visiting with Cindy Berkland of Eternity Financial. And just prior to the show, I said it was Walter Cronkite who used to say that's the rest of the story, but it was actually Paul Harvey, as I, as Cindy reminded me. I, I knew it was one of the two. But we, We're uh, dating ourselves, Patrick, for sure. <laughs> I know. I thought... I think wearing my suit like I am today, I look a little bit like one of those old time uh, news broadcasters, but um, I told Cindy I'm wearing a special just for her. The truth is I'm going to a wedding right after this show. So uh, yeah, I it's... thought I was special. <laughs> <laughs> you are. It's for both of you. But anyway, so um, we were talking about prior to the, the break about the crash of 2008 and how it affected both of our businesses and especially your Cindy. I mean, you had a dozen homes, you had commercial property, you had a thriving business. I mean, you said 85 employees or what, close to a hundred employees. Yes. And um, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's, that's not a small endeavor. It's not a small business. And so um, you talked a little bit about, how you basically turned to the Lord and said, you know, you got to help me through this. I don't know what to do next. And mm -hmm. if you don't mind, continue with your story of what came to you, what impressions you had and, and, and where you went from there, because I know it, it, you did pivot and you, you learned some things that you had, you wish you'd known 20 years ago that you're now teaching to others. You gained some lessons and some insights and, and so forth. I think that that migration that you made, that transition 
from where you were then and where you are today, it's a really fascinating story. It's something that I think our listeners would can can really benefit from, would really love to hear, uh, because it's 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 it has lessons and principles woven into it that can impact and bless any of our lives. I believe so. Yeah. Well, the time I, is yours. I was going. Um, I knew that the mortgage business, I couldn't stay in it. There was no way to make any money. There was just, nobody was lending money. And, you know, I had three young kids at the time to take care of. And I was a single mom. Mm. And I, I was like, I didn't have a back door. You know, I didn't have anybody to share in expenses with me. And my house payments like were huge. And I had to figure out, okay, what houses am I going to let go right away? Like it was literally that kind of a, a thing. And So I also had to switch careers because I'm like, okay, after being in the mortgage business 20 years and nobody's lending, uh, I got to, I got to make some kind of a pivot, some kind of a move. So, um, I, I really, uh, uh, how, how do I say this kindly? I, I went into the timeshare industry and I chose timeshare because it was still real estate and it was something I knew, um, but I knew like Vegas had been one of the hardest hit markets. So I knew that if I, I did timeshare in Vegas, timeshare is all around the world and we would be attracting people from all over the world. So uh, I wouldn't be as affected if I did, you know, even if I stayed in real estate in Las Vegas, as long as I did it in timeshare, I wouldn't be as affected. So mm-hmm. I went into timeshare and I, I had to learn the business very, very quickly because um, I had kids to feed. So um I, I learned the business and I basically stayed in timeshare and, and, and did pretty well at it for about, I, you know, I think it was three years, uh, you know, to, to survive that, um, during that time though, I had made some investments and the investments tanked and I, I was just looking at all my, like everything that I thought I had set up that was just like long-term savings and everything I had set up with my financial advisors were disappeared almost overnight. And I just couldn't believe that, you know, everything that I had was gone. I mean, it was one thing to lose money in real estate, but all my other investments. Well, in my horror, I realized I'm, I got very messed over with the the people that did my finances Mm -hmm. and I didn't have really time to figure out what went wrong. I just had to get in and and go into survival mode and feed my kids. So as a process, I was like, one of my first to the Lord was like, God, you got to help me figure out what I did wrong. Because I have always been the person that I cross every T, I dot every I, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I don't do number two very well. I have to be number one at everything I do. Mm-hmm. And with my money, it was the same way. Well, um, I learned, I had met up with a gentleman and he was like, Cindy, let me teach you a little bit about how money works. And I was like, um, as a mortgage professional, I thought I, I pretty much understood all that. I learned I did not. And after spending a lot of time with this gentleman, I learned what had happened to me. And I was very, very angry. I was like, I cannot believe this could possibly happen. So in my frustration and anger about what happened to me, I ended up going into the financial industry because when I learned how many products and what was out there and what was available, I was like, why didn't my financial advisors put me into these products? Because had they done this, I would be living the dream today. And I learned that um, my financial advisors made a great bit of money off me and I lost. And I had decided that I would get into the money business so that that on my watch would never happen to anybody. And I would spend the rest of my life telling people what I knew and what I learned about money. And so I think that's why I've been very, very successful. My story in the money business, because my story is one of a lot of loss. And um, now I teach people when I sit down and I watch them suffer the same loss as I did. And I am explaining to them why they're losing money and what's going on with their portfolio. They get that look in their eye that's pretty pissed off too, excuse me, because they're like, why is this happening? And I said, you don't need to be losing money. You can invest your money and not lose money. And, And 
they're like, well, why didn't my financial advisor or planner put me in this? And I'm like, well, you know, that's a question you should ask them, but right, you right. they end up transferring their portfolio over to me because, you know, I have spent many, many years learning about my industry and learning and shopping products and why you would do this product and why this. And um, I've just found that sometimes I, as an advisor or a financial planner, I take less money, but it's the better product for my client. And I know that when I do the right thing, I always win. And so for me, it's not so much about commission, but it's about doing the right thing for my fellow man. And that's kind of where, you know, the same thing happened with when I opened Speakeasy. It was really about uh, those that were also in my shoes, helping to save them through this process of what happened with COVID, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's uh, kind of always been my mentality is um, when you help a child of God, you can never outgive God. So when I help someone that God loves, God blesses me back so much more. I don't worry about money and commission. It comes automatically, you know, God blesses me. I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, man, there's a lot loaded into all of your, your, your comments here, Cindy, you know, you you talk about timeshare. I worked in vacation ownership for several years with a company. Well, we all, we've all heard of Wyndham, right? And uh, I was a customer first. I liked it so much. I went to work for them. And um, it's a, another similarity between us. But, um, you know, as you talk about how you've been through a lot of loss and you learned your lessons from that. And I think that's a, a, a pattern in life that most of us learn from from hardship, right? We learn from hard times. Um, it's interesting because many times counselors and coaches and and professionals like you, they go into the field they're in because they want to do better than the experience that they've had, right? We see parents who are fantastic parents, but they had a terrible childhood, yeah. right? Because they say, I'm not going to allow that to happen to my kids. And you're yes. saying, I'm not going to allow the same thing to happen to my clients that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, um, I think it's admirable and it's inspiring, but it's very, it's a very poignant commentary on, on experts in their field. If you look at their past, I think you'll see that pattern through many of their stories. Uh, it's definitely my own. I started and built a company of uh, our company, Certainty Management, the kind of company I always wanted to work for because I couldn't yep. find it anywhere, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I so. That's, I think I created with my mortgage company. It was, we had such a great mortgage company because I had worked for several and I was like, I don't want my mortgage company to be anything like that, you know, um, exactly. And the same thing with my financial services is, you know, um, my team, we create our own day. We create what we want every single day. We don't have, you know, I, I don't work well for other people because I, I am such a, a creative and, you know, an overachiever and, I, I, I usually outwork other people. So it's like, it doesn't, I've, I've always been a CEO because I just, you know, I'm always looking for that, creating that work environment that people just love to come to work and yeah. they can't wait to get to the office and we can't wait to be with each other. And um, I feel like we've done a good job. I have a very small team now, um, but we, we enjoy one another's company and we create our day. We sit down and go, okay, what are we creating today? Um, and I wouldn't have it any other way, you yeah, know, I wouldn't, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I want to comment on the name of your company because you've talked about God and, and I, I know you're a woman of faith, you're Christian and, uh, you have a ministry and ministry A and D yes. that uh, might have you comment on here in a minute, but I, I love that you've woven faith into your company name, Eternity Financial, you know. Well, I, let me correct you really quickly. Eternity Financial, I actually run Eternity Financial in Las Vegas. Eternity Financial was actually created and is owned by my, um, a very close friend of mine. His name is Edward Malikin. He is a very fabulous Jewish man from California. And he actually created Eternity Financial and asked me if I would take over and create a branch of Eternity Financial. So we joined forces, gosh, about five years ago. Um, so I was boots on the ground for him in 
um, in Las Vegas, but of course I was going to work with someone who was Jewish. I'm like the favorite one of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, I'm all in, you know, and he is an amazing man. We are great partners. Um, so he's not my boss, so to speak, but it is his company. And I do run his company here in Las Vegas. My company is called and sales and marketing. My ministry is called and ministry. Um, there's a, a trick there with the word and, um, my slogan is living in and not or for more. So that's why I just keep adding companies or whatever. And I also started a foundation this year called Nevada's giving. So I've been a nice. Girl. Yeah. So let's talk, uh, before the next break, let's talk about, um, this premium funding investment. Oh, premium financing. Okay. Premium financing. It's something that most people have never heard of. Yes. And yet, can you explain how it works and why it's one of your favorite offerings? I know you, you, okay. so you're really one of the passionate things about that it. When I learned about this product, I became so angry because I, I would be so wealthy today had my financial advisors put me in this product. But because I find a lot of people in the industry, they're afraid of this product because there is a lot of moving parts to it. And it's a lot of work for a financial advisor or planner. But for me, coming out of the mortgage business, it's not a lot of work. It's, it's actually much easier than doing a mortgage. Um, but some, some financial advisors steer away from it because it's just, you know, it has a lot of moving parts and they're afraid they're going to screw it up. But I'm like, you have to, you have to do the best job for your client. And if a product is the best for them, you've got to figure out how to get it done for them. And so I'm not afraid to roll up my sleeve and get my hands dirty for a client. Well, I learned about this product. Most people don't know about it because it was originally designed for the affluent. Um, premium financing is a life insurance policy, but it's usually for someone like historically, it would be for a doctor that makes, you know, $8 million, $10 million a year. And they need a life insurance policy that if they were to pass away, could take care of all of their, all their bills and, and keep their family going and their their company going long after they're, they've passed away. The problem with um, huge life insurance policies like that is they're very, very costly. And let's say this, this life insurance policy is going to cost maybe three, $4,000 a month. Well, a lot of people wouldn't want to pay for a life insurance policy like that. It's just too cost prohibitive. So what happens is a bank will come along and they will fund the policy with the client. Okay. So for every dollar you put in, the bank will put in $3. So the bank is basically picking up the bill on this. Well, why would a bank do this? Well, they actually make interest on this money that they're, they're, they're actually loaning the money. Um, and the great news about a premium financing deal is that you don't have to come up with uh, collateral. It, it's not like a mortgage loan where you're having to come up with all this documentation and prove your tax returns and all this kind of stuff because the life insurance policy is actually the collateral. So the bank is actually funding the life insurance policy. And what you end up with is a huge life insurance policy. And it's being funded kind of like your mortgage. You only put a small percent down on your house. The bank funds it. And then you pay them back over time. A premium financing life insurance policy is the same thing. It's just that now they've created premium financing for maybe um, the up and coming affluent, maybe somebody that makes $100,000 a year or $150,000 a year. So now your middle-class people actually can do a premium financing and the bank is you know, footing most of the bill. So now you've got a beautiful life insurance policy and in retirement, you're making a huge, you know, triple and quadruple what you would make in retirement um, that you could ever do with a 401k or anything like that. It's just that like with a 401k, it can go backwards because it's in the stock market, um, premium finance, and it cannot go backwards because it's tied to an index universal life policy, which has floors. So it can never go backwards or lose money. Um, so had somebody put me in this product when I was making all my money, I would be pulling down almost $200,000 a year in tax-free retirement income. And again, I'm into tax-free money. I prefer tax-free rather than tax. So I, I've spent a lot of time really researching what is the best product for people that can, you know, 
that, that can afford it or qualify for things. Um, it is my favorite product that I offer. Well, it's very fascinating. I I have lots of questions and we're up against our next break, but when we okay. come back, let me ask you a question or two more about it. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Yes. And then I want you to share the story of Speakeasy because Got it. it's it's always amazing how fast this hour flies by. We think, oh, we got to fill a whole hour. Well, it just goes by like that. Easy. But <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very interesting though. I'm interested to know the minimums and things like that. I, you know, is it, you, and I, I like how you refer to the up and coming. I, I know you use the word emerging affluent. Yes. Yeah. I think it's really a, a fantastic term um, because I know you believe, I believe that we have the ability to all develop wealth yeah. And to come out of where we're at, to go, to achieve these levels, we need good mentors. We need good advisors like you. We need we need to uh, learn from those who've gone before us. And uh, and yeah, let's go to break though. We're we're visiting with Cindy Berkland of Eternity Financial, and um, lots more to say. We'll be right back, guys. Thank you. All clear. Andrew, if you when you put the word following, I know we're out of time, so keep doing that if you can. Yeah, no worries, man. That's a kind that. way of saying you are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I keep watching the one minute. Okay, is it gone? Are we out of time? <laughs> it's probably at three minutes, but anyway. So, um, yeah, when we come back, you know, let's talk about um, how how a person gets started with that. Is there a minimum? investment or deposit or whatever i'm a big fan of indexed uh universal plans yes. you can't lose your money you have a guaranteed return you know yeah. it's even when the economy drops or if the market drops and then goes back up in many respects that's a return that you 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 could you can figure that into your overall return because you didn't have the loss yeah you know, it's you amazing here. like uh, the clients i sit down and do their annual reviews and I'm always reminding them of what they have because they're always, you know, when I, when I first get them, they're in panic mode because they're used to losing money and money going up and down and they're, they're panicking. Yeah. And I remind them, you know what you did? You saved yourself from losing $200,000 this year. And I let them know, you know, based on market today, you would have lost like $220,000 had you not moved your money over to this product and, and switched over to me. And you know, their eyes, they just realize. So once they're like three, four years in with me, they're like, what are we doing? How much money did we make this year? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's a amazing seconds. product. Thanks, Andrew. Here we go. Hmm. You are listening to Finding Certainty with Patrick Lang. Have a question for Patrick or his guests? Join us on the show at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now, back to the show with Patrick. Welcome back to Finding Certainty, everyone. We're visiting with my good friend, Cindy Berkland with Eternity Financial. And tell us again your name of your actual branch. So I'm I'm in Las Vegas for Eternity Financial, but I have my own company called And Sales and Marketing. And. Um, yeah. And tell us more a little bit about why you chose the And, because I think it's an interesting insight. Well, I knew, uh, you know, when I was rebuilding after, you know, the devastation, I said, I'm going to build a monopoly and I'm going to start with a company called and, and then I'm going to add subgroups. So I started with and sales and marketing, and then I added and ministry and I just keep adding um, companies. Um, so my slogan for the company is living in and not or for more, because a lot of people believe they can have this or that. And I said, well, what if you could have this and that? 
So, um, you know, when I do coaching or, you know, ministry or whatever, I make sure that people understand that we live um, under a God of much and he wants us to have much. And so the word needs to be and not or because you don't have a choice between one or the other. You get to have both and right. and 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 and. So that's where and came from. I love that. He is infinite, right? That's- yes. You know, I'm I'm a big proponent of that abundance mindset of living in faith. Yeah, I was just talking with my parents this morning. My dad has uh, a lot of health issues, and they're talking about changes they've had to make and how they've had to pivot. And you know, whether we're talking about our health or our our finances, our faith, um, we have to be able to maintain that that eternity focused perspective right that there's more possible there's abundance there's more you know i i wrote a book um i wrote a chapter in a book that came out recently you can find it on amazon it's called mission matters i was asked to write a um a chapter it's a it's focused on ceos whose companies are making a difference mm. and i wrote my book or, or my chapter excuse me on accountability uh, they asked me, they actually asked me to write the introduction as well. And which I did as a metaphor with fishing, just so you know, I mentioned I'm a fly fisherman, right? But, um, but in the chapter, I talked about how one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is what else can I do? Um, sometimes it's to ask for help. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. to consider a different perspective or step away from it. So maybe we're too close to it or whatever. And so your whole, your whole, uh, mantra of and versus or it goes right in line with that right Mm -hmm. okay so um real quick before we run out of time tell us uh, just a little bit more about the premium financing is there are there minimum investments is there a uh, does it have to be an accredited investor or something like that not at all so the base the basic to this now because it's for the emerging affluent the number you must make as a household income, this could be a husband and wife together, you must make at least $100,000 a year. So Mm -hmm. they will ask you to provide the last two years of your tax returns, just like you would for a mortgage to show that you make that kind of money that you can afford it. So what you need to understand is you only make five payments into this premium financing, into this life insurance policy. You make it once a year for five years, okay? It's Hmm. based on your age and your health. You must be in good health. You cannot be a smoker. You know, you have to have proof that you can make these payments. So let's say um, you're a 30 year old male and um, you, your premium might be around $30,000 a year for five years. So you're going to be making a premium of $150,000. But remember that the bank is going to be making three times that. So they're going to be putting in what, $450,000 into the policy. So um, you're using the bank's money to compound all this money. So you're only making a one-time payment a year. So typically I'm looking for people that have saved their money or maybe they're very behind on their um, retirement. Um, Typically this is a story with doctors. Um, They start making a bunch of money and then they get married and their wife starts helping them spend all their money. And now they're driving these amazing cars and um, they've they've created this amazing lifestyle but they haven't created a retirement to go with it. So they, they, they can show the income and they can make these premium payments but they're usually behind because they haven't uh, Mm. tackled their retirement. Many of us, we don't, most people don't realize that you need to save 30% of your income to have a retirement that's worthwhile. Well, most people go, oh my God, I can barely live day to day. How could I ever save even 10%? So premium financing catches you up and gets you where you need to be. Um, but it's not for somebody that's getting over the age of 61, 62 years old. This is somebody that we need to get before they age out. Um, so I try to, you know, I love getting people between the age of, you know, 30 and 55. Um, um, and then also now they've allowed us, um, I have a client right now that she only makes about $30,000 a year, but her parents make about 120000 excuse me, $120,000 a year. And they would like to give her her retirement now. They're getting up in age. And so 
I, um, we have a program called the greatest wealth transfer ever. That's what it's called. The greatest wealth transfer ever. And the Bible talks about the greatest wealth transfer when, um, the Israelites left Egypt. That was the greatest wealth transfer until what we're seeing now. Now with the baby boomers aging out, we're seeing the greatest wealth transfer ever. So the company I work with now has a, has a program called the greatest wealth transfer ever. And that's where baby boomers or, you know, people that are getting older, they want to give their children and their grandchildren their wealth now while they're still alive. So what we're able to do is to prove their income along with her income and they are paying her premium finance or her premium payments over the next five years um, out of their, actually out of their annuity um, so that they know that she will have, it's guaranteed that she will have a beautiful retirement. Um, and they know this while they're alive. They don't want to have to worry about her having to get married or something just to make a, you know, to have a retirement. Um, so this, this program is, is so beautiful that especially if you have a kid that maybe hasn't been very wise with their money or maybe have had some addiction in the past and they're afraid that if they pass away and someone gets maybe a million dollars that they'll squander it away, this ensures that that can't happen. Um, so there are so many moving parts to this thing. It is, it is a really fantastic program, but it, it guarantees that the client will have a tax-free retirement income for the rest of their life. That is very, very lucrative. So it's, oh, that's that's really interesting. I'm a, as I was telling you during the break, I'm a huge fan of of indexed, universal yes. policies. You cannot and that's lose what your it's money. tied to. Yeah, you cannot I mean, lose your money. It, you know, the money goes into the stock market, but the life insurance company takes on all the risks. So you're only making money on years that the, the stock market is making money, but the years that the stock market loses money, you hold. Life right. insurance company takes the beating if need, if need be. Yeah, we have an index policy that pays a minimum of like 4% or something um, guaranteed. And yet anything above that, you, you you make it. But if it drops below, you don't lose. You, you, you have correct. that guaranteed return. Is your, is your uh, bottom, is it a similar rate? Is it higher than that, lower than that? What, or so the bottom is at zero, okay? But again, when you have a life insurance company putting in three to four times what you're putting in, it, it's like having a 401k plan on crack. Um, yeah. You have the, you know, you putting in a dollar and then let's say your your boss is putting in a dollar. But the problem is if next year, if the stock market bottoms, bottoms out, let's say you lose 30%, everything you put in and your boss put in was for nothing. In this case, with the premium financing, they're putting in three times what you did. And if the stock market goes down 30%, you're holding right at zero. So to me, that's a win because no matter what, you're getting three times your money guaranteed in this product. Plus there's a death benefit at the end, right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. We've got about two more minutes before the show is over. Tell us, oh, wow. tell us your 60 second story on Speakeasy because it's really, I think it's really interesting. Okay. So what I saw with um, when they rolled out COVID and they were going to shut down everybody um, the first thing I knew was this is 2008 all over again, and I am not going to go down and I am not going to watch my fellow business owners here in Las Vegas go down. So I decided to have a networking event held at my home. Um, obviously restaurants were shut down and I wasn't going to let our governor tell me that I was um, not essential or my fellow business owners were not essential. So we started with um, 18 people at my home right when COVID started. And I started holding the networking event um, once a month at my home. Um, we have gotten into upwards of 120 business owners coming through. So we had to start a West side. A friend of mine opened his home in the West. Um, so um, we've had Summerlin and Henderson. And we typically will have 70 to 80 people through my home once a month um, for Speakeasy. And we've kept it going it's been going now about two and a half years um and the reason we do this is because there was so many businesses that would have gone under had they not had an outlet in which to do business so we saved three three businesses from bankruptcy and we've had two startups since we've started so i'm very very proud of speakeasy networking um here in henderson it's it's been um a wild ride let's just say that 
Well, I've been to your events. I don't know of anyone who puts on a nicer, uh, just a nicer event. Uh, just the food is always amazing. It's just sort of a potluck approach. And so the, the you have really loyal um, members who come yes. every month. Yep, they don't miss. Yeah. Okay, so in closing, we could talk lots more. I'm telling you, the hour flies by on these shows. But uh, in closing, how can people get a hold of you? And uh, where do they go to find um, more information? Easiest way would be Cindy Berkland at gmail.com, or you can reach me on my cell phone. I'll give you my private cell phone, 702-683-7429. All right, and cindyberkland.com, right, is the yep. website? cindyberkland.com. If you have questions on the show, everyone, or anything more on uh, my guest today, Cindy Berkland, or about Certainty Management, our profitability consulting firm, please uh, text the word CERTAINTY to 26786, and we will get you more information. So thanks again for being on the show today, Cindy. It's a real pleasure to get to know you. I'm so glad we met and are becoming friends, and uh, just keep on keeping on. What you're doing for the community and your clients is is very impressive. So I wish Thank you the very you best. Me. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, Cindy. It's uh, it's going to be a great next year. And I'm looking forward to uh, lots more conversations just like this one. Yeah. Thank you. All clear. Great job today, everyone. Thank you, sir. Take care and have a happy New Year. We'll see you next time. You too. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Well, that was easy. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not hard. I, uh, I'm glad I I understood because on your website it doesn't talk about and sport sales and marketing. All I saw was Eternity Financial. So um, really, the whole you. the whole main thing says and. Huh. It talks well, yeah, it has, but I thought it was it, Eternity. I have four to, boxes. Uh, yeah, I have one for I mortgage. Thought, yeah, they're drop down boxes. I thought it was referring more to. I thought the, I thought the end part was referring more to your foundation, which or the ministry work. The and uh, um, anyway, yeah, so that's good to have. That's that's brilliant. Yeah. So, do you have plans for the new year? Doing anything interesting? Um, well, Kevin and I had we had kind of talked about New Year's, but he's still busy with his family with the birthday party. So he will be coming back out, I think, on the 5th. So I'm like, well, what's a couple of days? So he'll be out here, you know, because we still have more, um, you know, for the the fund. You know, I still have a lot more people um, mm -hmm. that want to invest in that. So I'm setting up more meetings. And then he's going to come out for a birthday party for a friend of mine. Go cool. with me. Maybe before we cut off the YouTube, you can talk briefly about this 4% guaranteed option that you have um you yeah so we we had you know i had talked to him about what i could do for my clients a lot of my clients are in a place where um they have their money in the bank it's making no interest but they don't really want to lock up their money in an annuity or anything like that you know where you, they know they'll make maybe eight percent a year but they don't want to lock up the money because the market's so crazy so um you know, we're setting up a fund. Kevin is um, going to be handling the money through his wealth group. Um, and he is guaranteeing 4% interest um, to my friends, family, and clients. So it's a monthly guaranteed interest of 4%. Um, which is which phenomenal. 48% <laughs> a year. 48% um, a year. And he puts, he won't take on any more. And Kevin is a good friend of Cindy's. Uh, from Florida, he owns a hedge fund. He owns several yeah. companies. Been very, very successful uh, as a trader. He's and a trader by need, by by uh, by his business. So yeah. um, he's guaranteeing it and securing it with his TD Ameritrade account. But you know, we're not going to exceed two million dollars for the fund because he does have to guarantee it. But you know, he understands what a lot of people have been through, and he's like, you know, let's just put this together. We'll do short-term money. You know, they can they can put it in for six months. And then if they want to renew, they can renew at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, <laughs> one client that has a million dollars, she goes, I will give you a million dollars right now. You know, she's got a million dollars sitting in the bank. And, you know, with us, it'll be making 40 grand a month. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Is there a minimum investment for that? Um, he, he says no, but we're, we're trying to keep it at around 20 grand. 
it's just a lot of accounting on their end. Um, So 20 grand would be probably the lowest we would go just because, you know, that's a lot of bookkeeping. Yeah. Okay. Well, anybody listening, if you want a 4% a month return with a guaranteed backing, he, he will not... He said he won't take on any more than he could personally re- refund if he had right. to. So, and just so you know, he makes he averages ten percent a month or yes. more on his yeah. investments. So he's just saying, I'll pay four percent of it out and keep the rest. And yeah, and uh, it's um, a so this has been very helpful for one of my clients. She's she's wanting to retire. She has quite a bit of money with annuities with me, but she really doesn't want to touch that money yet. So she put in a hundred thousand. Um, which is giving her four, four grand a month. So that was the number where she can actually not even have to work part-time anymore. She, she really works because she wants to, but she says, I like the option of not having to work at all. So that extra four grand a month has made it to where she can just walk away. That's awesome. So, yeah. So it's something he's willing to continue doing then for a long for, time. She's a case by case because, you know, I said for someone that just doesn't want to dip into her retirement just yet. Um, this is a nice little avenue that she was very excited about, you know, and, you know, I didn't know I'd have that, you know, when great minds put their heads together, he said, why don't you do something like this? I said, okay, let's absolutely do that if you're willing to do that. So I'm, mm-hmm. I am very excited that we're, I'm able to offer that. That's really great. Yeah. Well, if you have any information uh, or if you want any information, as, as she said, uh, maybe leave, give us your email and your phone number one more time on the video um, here. Email is cindyberkland at gmail.com. And the website is cindyberkland.com, which has every which way to get a hold of me. And then my phone number is 702-683-7429. Yeah, and that's Berkland, B-I-R-K-L-A-N-D. L-A-N-D. You'll see yeah. it in the description for the show as well. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this. Thank you for the opportunity, Patrick. You've been amazing. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Got to help each other out, right? Yes. The, uh, uh, you know, the, the future is bright. I'm very excited about what's happening. Really nice to get to know you. And I'm getting to know Kevin, who I think is a great, great connection. And uh, the rest of your speakeasy group, they're a good group of people. I'm enjoying being. Yeah. I hope to see you on Tuesday. The next event is on Tuesday. I is it this it's this coming week, right? On the third, yeah. I unfortunately will still be in Utah, but I will catch you in February for sure. Gotcha. Okay. So all right. Thanks everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>